We are in a revolution. But it is a revolution in which the side that fires the first shot loses. We will not fire any shots because our weapon is uncommon good sense. Hello and welcome to Tractor Time. Tractor Time is brought to you by TPS Lab and Acres USA, the voice of eco agriculture. I'm your host, Ben Trollinger, editor of Acres USA magazine. On this episode, the return of Doug Fine. Operating out of the Funky Butte Ranch in southern New Mexico, Doug is a hemp farmer by day, journalist by night, entrepreneurial dynamo 24 7. His writing has appeared in places like The Washington Post, Wired, Outside Magazine. He's traveled all over the world, he's given TED Talks, he's appeared on late night talk shows, and he's written several books, including Not Really an Alaskan Mountain Man, Farewell My Subaru, Too High to Fail, Cannabis in the New Green Economic Revolution, and Hemp Bound, Dispatches from the Front Lines of the Next Agricultural Revolution. His latest book, American Hemp Farmer, is a follow-up to Hemp Bound, and it celebrates the men and women who are blazing a path in the regenerative, farmer-driven hemp industry. Doug also recently put out a brand new online course on growing and marketing regenerative hemp. For more on that, visit learn.acresusa.com. That's learn.acresusa.com. This is Doug's second time on the podcast, and we're grateful to have him back. But before we talk with Doug about his new book, these messages. Since 1938, TPS Lab has been a pioneer in soil health, balanced plant nutrition, and water quality management. As more and more growers move to sustainable and organic farming practices, we are uniquely positioned to provide all the guidance they need to improve soil health and plant nutrition to make them more profitable and eco-friendly. With services that range from one-on-one consultations to customized season-long crop nutrition programs, TPS Lab guides growers with analysis-based strategies for managing crop nutrition for better performance with higher resistance to disease and insects. Our goal is to see growers become more sustainable and profitable. Visit us at tpslab.com or call 956-383-0739. When you call, mention you heard this message on the podcast and receive 10% off any testing service you order. TPS Lab, your crops dietitians. Okay, Doug Fine. This interview was recorded last year, and it's our first podcast of 2021. And I have to say, Doug's a perfect guest to kick off a new season. He's enthusiastic. He's optimistic. He has a big vision for the future of regenerative hemp. And he's in the trenches doing the work to bring it into reality. And without further ado, here's my interview with Doug Fine. Hello, Doug. Welcome to Tractor Time. Thank you, Ben. And um, if I'm humming and clapping here it's because in the distance my 10 year old is playing uh, the chicken dance on the accordion so i'm kind of dancing as i was uh waiting for us to roll but it's good to be back with you on tractor time well i'm always interested to hear about what's going on in the funky butte ranch um it, it seems kind of to have a circus-like atmosphere and um the accordion seems to fit right into that uh we'll tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and the ranch you're in the middle of growing season right now Yep, we just harvested here. We're higher than a mile high, 5,700 feet in New Mexico. And um, it's a very fragrant time of year because the terpenes, the carbon compounds that reside in hemp flowers are flowing everywhere there. As you're harvesting them, you're smelling them, and the stickiness stays on your fingers um, when you do podcast interviews. And um, it's believed by Michael Pollan and others that we've co-evolved with the cannabis hemp plant and that it's what is definitely known is that we have this built-in or endocannabinoid system that awakens when we smell these cannabinoid related terpenes and is ready for the health maintenance benefits of, of, the, of the hemp plant. So that is going on like crazy uh, here on the ranch at, at this time of year. We primarily grow our own crop, a very small home crop here on the ranch for our own food, super hemp seed is a super food. And then I am also doing breeding development, Gregor Mendel style, um, both for varieties that grow well here in high desert um, at this latitude, but also that provide the qualities that I'm, I'm, I and my family are looking for in the variety of hemp that we want for ourselves. So that's what's going on with hemp, which is just, of course, one part of our uh, wacky, neo-rugged individualist life here in the Funky Butte Ranch. Right, and you have goats running around and and all kinds of stuff going on. 
homeschooling and other right. plants too. Our, our hemp garden is a polyculture garden. It's good friends with tomatoes, beans, basil, uh, peppers, uh, kale, and on and on. And so, um, yeah, this is, this is just, you know, another plant in the garden as it has been for 8,000 years. The only one though, as my, uh, sons are often puzzlingly asking me the only one that requires a $700 permit, uh, to grow. Right. Well, you mentioned Gregor Mendel and I'm interested in hearing more about your process and how you do that. I mean, really it's just about observing which plants are doing well and sort of trying to select for certain traits that you want to see. Talk a little bit more about that. Without generalizing, the reason why I believe that uh, independent farmers on small acres, especially, but especially just independent regenerative farmers um, are producing the highest quality of any crops, but certainly hemp crops, top shelf craft market is what I am part of. And the only thing I'd ever want to frequent as, as a customer, ideally from my own region, um, crops growing in the sun and in, in the soil, native soil that you're building with ideally as many local inputs as possible. You know, in my case, family goat poop um, uh, and mycelium that we gather in the hills, things like that, not, not, not much else. Um, that's going to be the best. And, I, and, and my theory is one of the reasons um, for that is exactly what you asked in the question. It's being in that field every day. And um, Gregor Mendel himself was doing it in his own field and um, what we might call modern academic modes have their place, I'm sure. But in terms of really looking every day and seeing how the plant is developing over cycles, how it's handling a hailstorm, how it's handling a, um, a, a super heat wave in, this, in our case here in the high desert before monsoon comes and there's climate uncertain time. You never know if it's coming, coming on time, coming late, coming big, not that much. And um, watching that, that hardiness and, or even thriving under these kind of conditions, that involves being in the garden every day. So when it comes to breeding, it's very much about that. It's getting to know individual plants and knowing what, what I'm looking for. And I'm, I don't consider myself an expert breeder, but you know, as with all sides of the, uh, hemp world. I'm trying it. I'm trying to do these things myself, even up to man making a top shelf regenerative project pr product um, is, you know, instead of giving entrepreneurial advice, I'm going to try and do it and see how it works. And can you afford compostable uh, uh, um, labels, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a, in the new book, American Hemp Farmer, the one of the key tips, one of the first things I pointed out, one of the key tips I got from my mentor, Bill Althaus of the Fat Pig Society Organic uh, Hemp Co-op in uh, Colorado. It, it sounded so simple at the time when I was just leaping into hemp. What, you know, was the number one tip. He said, you're doing it. Be in your field every day. Get your fingers dirty. If that's not what you want to do or you think your role in the enterprise is something else, find another line of work. This is about being in that field every day for practical reasons like if your drip line is clogged, you could lose plants if you're not paying attention to them every day. But also it's about cultivating a, a relationship with the ecosystem that is providing superfood to you. And if you're an entrepreneur to your customers as well. You know, I was talking to Chris Smith, who's wrote a book called The Whole Okra, um, which is a great book, but a lot of it is focused on the sort of genetic selective breeding stuff that you're talking about. And you know, people have been doing that for decades. And as a result, they're just a huge galaxy of different varieties of okra. And I'm wondering, because of the prohibition of growing hemp has been in place for decades, how much ground did we lose in terms of breeding hemp for specific uses? Um, I mean, I know marijuana growers or cannabis growers, uh, you know, selecting for psychoactive properties and high THC levels, they've been doing their thing for a long time underground until legalization in some states. What about hemp though? I mean, have we, are, are you gaining ground? Um, are, are there people out there like you who are doing this kind of work too? That's a fantastic question, Ben. And in fact, we are gaining ground. Prohibition has actually been a benefit to this emerging renaissance in cannabis hemp. 
We can talk a little bit later about why I say cannabis hemp and the arbitrariness of THC definitions delineating them and the recency of the THC delineations uh, separating the two. But for our purposes right now, can the cannabis hemp plant, um, here's another Michael Pollan quote, cannabis hemp farmers are the best farmers of my generation, said Michael Pollan. Mm -hmm. And prohibition has forced independent farmers to do Gregor Mendel style research and not just develop the best varieties that cultivated well in their ecosystem. I once uh, embedded for a year and wrote a book about psychoactive cannabis farmers in Northern California called Too High to Fail. That specific genetics developed over multiple generations in specific climate, specific soil. Um, that's called terroir. And that's what's, that's what's so big in, in, on the hemp side as well, as it is in, you know, champagne and Parmesan cheese, right? So, you know, you, you, they've not only developed the best varieties for their terroir, but they've also developed the mode of knowledge for how to develop cannabis, how to grow cannabis well, what to look for, how to hand pollinate varieties that you want and look for what they call unicorns. And I was educated on that already from other cannabis books before I leapt in personally to the hemp world as a farmer, a farmer entrepreneur, and, and of course, author. Um, so I was ready for that. I knew how to brush pollen uh, and when the, the female, uh, male pollen on a female hemp flower and when that plant would be receptive and, and how, what the cycle looked like. So we are the ones that now academia and big ag are looking to for not just information about how to do it, but the genetics themselves. So we are in a very strong position. We have the genetics and we know how to develop the genetics for whatever properties are wanted. Um, just to give one gazillion, one in a gazillion examples. Right now I'm wearing a hemp shirt that my sweetheart uh, made uh, for me. And um, in its pocket is a 3D printed plastic composite uh, goat, appropriately enough, in um, grown from US hemp and 3D printed. Uh, goodbye Pacific Garbage Patch. Those are both fiber applications, applications from the fiber side of the plant. So yeah. you might be growing for not just fiber varieties, but very distinct fiber properties for textiles and a shirt versus um, uh, uh, the ideal um, um, fiber to be made into, let's say, a 3D printed uh, material. Well, that's not hard. I've actually been part of doing that, making the composite out of the hemp, and it's not hard. But long story short, we the farmers know what to look for, and we know how to get there. And why this is so important is owning the genetics Owning your seed, to me, is one of the key tenets to this independent, regenerative farmer, entrepreneurial renaissance that I'm focusing on an American Hemp Farmer, the new book, and that is what I talk about all the time now and think about and, and, and try to walk the walk as much as I can about. So there's your regenerative principles, you know, building your soil locally, as we said, uh, compostable label, like right, right through shipping, deliver in electric cars to immediate moderate radius. Ideally, I mean, that's a, that's a big ask for now. But, you know, this is this is humanity's survival we're talking about here. This isn't a game. I mean, this is the, the as we speak, I'm, I'm looking at, at, at fire shrouded hills in my New Mexico hills from California fires. This is crazy stuff, people. This is not a dress rehearsal. We're really, we've got to sequester the carbon and regenerative agriculture and regenerative entrepreneurialism in every industry is absolutely key. So the, all the actual seed in the earth stuff is important, but from an entrepreneurial standpoint, from a, from a freedom standpoint, and not, I would go so far as to say a human rights standpoint, from a building reg, uh, uh, regional communities, not just rural communities, but especially rural communities that have suffered so much from the from monoculture and, and, and the associated economics and toxicity of it, as we emerge from that with this knowledge, this is why I say thank a prohibitionist because we've had 80 years to have to do this, you know, you know, hemp has had to survive in ditches or psychoactive cannabis farmers have had to grow uh, surreptitiously. And then boom, here we are back. And anyone who tries to tell us, well, you're saying you want to own and control and save your seed. That's not how it's been done. Uh, either you buy from a seed person that owns the seed and then you buy it the next year and you dump the poison on and you, and, the answer to that, good answer to that, I think is, gee, how's that been working out for farm economies? How's that been working out for the climate? How's it been working out for things like diabetes and obesity epidemics? You know, guess what? We're doing it a different way. Come along if you like, but we're not following a broken system. 
We're, we're doing it. And we're, we are the farmers. We are the entrepreneurs at this point. And this is how it's always been. For better or for worse, Little House on the Prairie, Charles Engel was planting wheat from seed he carried in a coffee can, probably hemp too. He was not a serf to a seed company. He harvested and knew to save the seed that his family security and his business, you know, his entrepreneurial farming business depended uh, on that, right? So this is not uh, a new uh, idea. And it also leads to better hemp products because our genetics are our IP. They are our intellectual property, we independent farmers. What you grow and how you grow it, where you are is gonna be different from the genetics uh, anywhere else. So it's not the easiest thing in the world to think this way. It's easier to do it in that mode of the seed company sells you the seed you sow if you live in a big acreage state, thousands of acres, a couple of sections, right? And then all you gotta do is harvest it, it uh, harvest it and drop it off at the, at the silo and you know you might be in a debt cycle and and it might not be great for soil but at least you're done uh for the year this is different now you own the whole enterprise as again second time i've brought up this mentor bill bill altaus of the fat pig society as he reminds me farmers get something like three cents on the dollar uh hmm. for most uh farming products at the retail price level and his goal mine and i hope everyone's is 100 cents on the dollar less expenses meaning the farmers are not wage contractors for some hemp enterprise they are the enterprise and that also involves a, an awakening for the customer um, to say i'm going to seek out my regional regenerative providers of the type of hemp product that i want on all sides of the plant seed superfood flower cannabinoids textiles uh, toothpastes uh, whatever it is um, this is something we're going to have to do together and the win-win is you get the better product <laughs> Well, talk about, I mean, are, are large corporations take, I mean, obviously, if there's money in hemp, large corporations are taking notice. But I, I get a sense of urgency among small hemp growers that we've got to gain a lot of ground, we've got to start co-ops, we've got to work together in order to ensure that large corporations are going to step in and start to dominate the market like they do in, in other crops like corn or soybeans or what have you. We'll talk a little bit about that. that that climate or that situation, um, do you see large corporations sort of, you know, ferociously and, and, and aggressively trying to come into the market? And what are you seeing among small hemp growers to counteract that? I will channel here my best Chauncey Gardner. Folks haven't read the book, Being There, see the movie, it's worth seeing. Um, here, and I will speak about the economy uh, here, kind of in an organic garden farm garden kind of mode and say and, and act as though everything's natural okay so what ha what arose is this situation of this mushrooming of the way that any business has worked for the last what 100 200 300 years let's say depending on how far back you want to go in terms of uh the idea is uh a, a seed grows and then when it reaches a certain level of maturity the stock market mentality this it, it becomes owned by corporations and shareholders uh, who never have any idea what's going on in the actual field, uh, whose motivations are only profit. And then, you know, the positive being wide distribution, maybe you could argue uh, uh, uniformity and whatnot. So as long as that's, that's working, you know, I'm, I'm looking at my miracle uh, product here, my miracle digital age product, by the way, hemp supercapacitors in our digital age products can help free us from rare earth uh, resource issues and human rights issues and environmental issues, but we can talk about that later, but I'm looking at my miracle digital device here that's allowing us to speak today over the, you know, from a thousand miles away from each other. And, um, you know, I'm very glad that, you know, that, that was, a, that was able to happen. But when it comes to the food system operating under that model, that just, you know, maximum production, maximum profit, um, nothing else matters model, besides the fact that environmentally it's almost killing humanity, the agricultural uh, runoff and carbon use from non-regenerative is, is, is one of the most uh, carbon emitting and toxic in industries. But in just in terms of economy, that huge mushroomy shell has reached its limit. It's crazy now. Are the food laws that we are operating under, um, let's say domestically, there's a whole sort of NAFTA-like global food sa safety in quotes initiative uh, as well. But in the U.S. is this FISMA, Food Safety Modernization Act, uh, passed, I think, 2008, written by supermarket industry lobbyists 
And the idea is reducing liability and increasing uniformity for massive distributors to get them, you know, basically the wonder bread uh, to everyone. And, you know, I arguably, even though since we've started this podcast, there's been four or five cases of salmonella, there's 40,000 reported a year. It's not like food's getting safer, but arguably the point is you sanitize everything. The farmer never touches a product. It's all labs, greenhouses, whatever. And, you know, the farmers are not entrepreneurs. And not only that, they better not be in even touching their crop. Um, the, that nonsense is running our food industry right now. So it's rotten. It's broken. It's, it's completely, it's like the Easter Island monolith built right before the collapse of a society, like this last ditch effort of, of a food system that isn't working anymore. Yields are going down, farmer suicide crisis, blah, blah, blah. We know health crisis, obesity, diabetes. So, that exists. And um, as long as there are people that are trying to invest in that and are still playing the 20th century game, if you think the goal, the buyout is going public or hedge fund, you know, inoculation of third round investment, blah, 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 blah. like, okay, <laughs> if you're going to play that game, go for it. And, and hemp's a big tent. I'm not going to uh, criticize any hemp, but I'm not interested in buying McHemp from fungible CBD in a in a in a um, chain drugstore any more than I would buy anything in that kind of environment. It's it's right. uh, not even the same thing as the kind of hemp that we're talking about when we talk about our craft uh, hemp niche. So we have this opening where we can say we're going to professionalize the craft market the craft agriculture market. It's a kind of a new category. As we know, craft beer is already really just taken over from mass market beer. Craft in this beer is going to be the majority of hemp, uh, beer consumed in the marketplace in 15 or so years. It's all, it's gaining 1% per year because it's better and it's regionally produced and all that kind of stuff. And so we have this, we're, we are the leading brand already, the craft hemp producer. The key here is maintaining it. And for that, we have to have a regulatory structure that supports us. And this is a new thing because the only way that you can produce the kind of living foods, the living kind of hemp that, that we're talking about here in the current mode is in a farmer's market kind of mode, a CSA kind of mode, a, a almost a bake sale kind of mode. And believe it or not, every state has rules that allow this kind of mode for providing living foods, but generally only up to a certain very small limit. Our goal is to professionalize those, maintaining, yes, best practices, food security, but it's a completely different direction, a completely different mindset than what FISMA and the current sort of FDA directions have been for the food system. It's a whole different, it's a, it's a new day, people. It's a renaissance. And for that, we're going to need uh, cohesiveness amongst independent farmers. We're going to need uh, our own lobbyists and lawyers to get the point across. Um, and in the book, I've, uh, um, I've kind of sketched starting points for what this craft niche might look like. How Maybe it's 15 tons of production uh, per year. Maybe it's a 500 mile radius uh, for your crop. It always has to be organic certified. It always has to be a farmer owned enterprise, things like this. And look, I'm not the final arbiter on this, but I do think we need that niche as a counter current to uh, the old way of doing things, which simply is just, in my view, not as healthy or as delicious or in any way as good as what we craft top shelf hemp entrepreneurs are going to be providing. Talk about some of the arrangements that small hemp farmers are making in order to increase their sort of uh, influence. Uh, talk about co-ops. There are all kinds of different organizational structures that farmers can enter into or develop uh, if they want to, you know, increase, for example, collect enough money to buy process, processing equipment for fiber, let's say. You, you detail some of this in, in your book, and, and I think our listeners might be kind of interested in hearing um, some of the examples that you, you provide there. First off, we are, I won't say embryonic, because we are, are launched as a hemp industry. I mean, not bad, 500,000 permitted, permitted acres of hemp in the U.S. just a couple of seasons after federal legalization. Uh, for the first time in 80 years of cannabis hemp plant in any variety. So we're launched, we're birthed, but we're, we're infants, really, really infants. I mean, gosh, we, you can't even chart metrics. I get such a kick 
out of seeing again old model type business conjectures on you know what's the, what's the CBD market looking like? It's like, first of all, have you ever been to a farm? Second of all, <laughs> it's we're just starting. Something like one percent of American homes have any hemp product at all, which is good news. It means that there's huge room for expansion. But more than that, the markets are in the wild west phase of just you can't predict what's going to happen in any one year stabilization it's the opposite of stabilization but it's also appropriate it's also as long as the regulations allow us to do thing do what we want to do those of us that are serious about it and have a multi-year game plan can you know hold on to the bunk and bro- bunk and bronco and, and ride our way through by by uh, having something that's better um and that that customers want um and that's what stability is um, so I have to preface any answer on this by saying we are so, so early in this industry that when I give models, they're sometimes like one of the only entities doing this that I know of so far, if you follow what I mean. And that said, there's more all the time. I, I'm, I love getting notes from people that said, I, I read your book and, uh, just so you know, we too are doing this, you know, uh, organic co-op or, 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 or farmer owned bee corporation or, or whatever it is. And this is, by the way, a worldwide phenomenon. You know, the new book's called American Hemp Farmer, but I, it should be called Worldwide uh, Hemp Farmer. And um, so with that preface, I will talk about a co-op that I like uh, now third times uh, a charm <laughs> with these folks, the Fat Pig Society in, in Colorado my colleagues and mentors, Bill Althaus, uh, Eugenia Bocalandro, and a few others, they were ready. I knew them. They were friends of mine in New Mexico. Um, the instant Colorado legalized hemp, Colorado being a few years ahead of New Mexico, they, they were economic emigres that I used as examples of the lost revenue uh, in testifying to try to get here the land of enchantment to legalize, which we finally did. We changed governors. And we're about to, we're, we just harvested our second, uh, second crop. So they're up in Colorado and they formed this organic co-op and there was one rule. You want to join this co-op. All you have to do is be growing certified organic and then boom, you are in, it's a farmer owned thing. Um, and, um, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, um, story what they've been doing and it has been anything but easy for them not necessarily just because of the economic side, because again, they were growing regeneratively and organically. So guess what? Their product was superior and people found them. And they even now, besides their own product, they also white label for, for a big pet food company, not, not corporate big, but a Colorado based that keeps the bills play. It keeps, keeps the lights on. They've pay their farmers. Um, it's very small scale, but it's happening. Um, and it's growing. So that's one entity that I like and that as I, my own entrepreneurial efforts develop and grow very slowly um, that I want to try and keep in mind. I love the idea of a cooperative, but there are other ways to do it. To my mind, it's the same with soil building. Soil building in the field is so vital, so important, step one, but I don't think there's any one correct way. I do recommend certifying organic just because that makes a certain kind of statement. It means you aren't using a certain kind of toxins and et cetera, et cetera. It's not a very, uh, you know, it's not the ultimate designation. One would want to go much uh, further than that, but you start with these things. There's Korean natural farming. There's other Bokashi based. There's other effective microorganism growing elements in soil building. I don't care which one you do as long as it's legit and, and, and wonderful. Right. So likewise there, I don't think there's any one exact business model entrepreneurial model the main thing just is the farmers are at the ownership level it's not some investor is writing and the exit i got a pitch from a media company recently and they were so honest our exit strategy is get bought out by you know whatever disney and i was like whoa so your game plan this is not some kind of like heart love passion develop build community no this is just Bottom line, dude, we like your content. We think it's going to let us get million, hundreds of millions of dollars when Disney buys us out. And like, oh man, that's missing a few things. Um, I mean, or not when it comes to media, but when it comes to a farming uh, enterprise, that's to me, the model is long-term community building and enterprise owned regionally. That's, that's the key thing. And yes, it's happening. 
more and more. Is it easy? No. Entrepreneurialism is risky even when you're not worried about the vicissitudes of mother nature. So um, I, anybody who goes into it, you've got to have that passion. Um, but I don't even need to say that because everybody who goes into hemp does have that passion. Well, so hemp is celebrated for its many uses um, from superfood to building material. And in the beginning, when hemp made its comeback, CBD was the hot market and that's sort of cooled off um, a little bit. And where are we now? What are the next frontiers? In the book, you say, you know, if you're growing hemp, uh, plan for plan B. So what are, what are those plan Bs out there right now? Yes, I'll talk about the different architectures of the plant, and it's kind of a wide open field on all sides of the plant. So much opportunity, uh, of course, as we said earlier, with, uh, associated with risk, but so much potential. Um, and a leading, a spearhead of the overall movement to the return to biomaterials for the whole economy, to wean us from, wean us from pet, petroleum, petrochemicals on our industrial feedstock, but also to mitigate um, uh, climate change. Again, well, uh, I'm sure we both are amidst um, smoke right now. But first off, Ben, I'm so glad to hear, well, when I say glad, it's interesting to hear the CBD gold rush referred to as the past tense, you know, was CBD for all. Right. Because when right. I was writing American Hemp Farmer over this past year, year and a half, by saying, you better think beyond this, people, this is a gold rush, this is a bubble, this is not how it works. And also, hemp and cannabis is a plant, meaning with whole plant compounds and entourage effect. And if you're just isolating one little thing out of it, and turning it back into a pharmaceutical, uh, there's some question marks remain about effectiveness, bioavailability, but also long-term viability of the of the market and the products and 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 of the planet for that matter, right? So I, that's just like one of the premises of, of American hemp farmer, and it, it it came to pass, you know, here this year of just people are calling it a CBD wholesale price crash, but it's not that. It's what we talked about earlier. It's a, in my view, it's just a brand new market it's brand new talking about farmers that were receiving up to three thousand dollars a pound for dry cbd focused sensimia flower flower only cannabis two years ago that are now being offered four or eight dollars a pound for that from three thousand dollars to eight dollars a pound wow. that's not how economics works that's not a crash that's just it's new and nobody knows what is really going on yet um, it's just, you know, it's too new. And for all these reasons, this is why I recommend this farm to product on farmer entrepreneurial model. Side note, before I answer some, about some of the markets, while I love this farmer entrepreneurial model um, for so many reasons, some of which we've discussed, it was also really imbued in my mind by the great Wendell Berry early in the book. It's documented where I was asked to invite him to a hemp conference. So I wrote to him on hemp paper, of course, in port in PO box one in his part of Kentucky to come to this conference. And he called me and left me a voicemail that I still have. I'm paraphrasing here. Um, he said, uh, you know, if you're speaking about hemp, I, I can't make the conference. I'm not as mobile as I once was, but just please tell everyone what I learned from my grandparents starting the hemp and tobacco cooperatives here in Kentucky you know, the middle man was screwing everyone over. This is also, by the way, while the national, why the National Farmers Union started in uh, North Dakota, of which I'm a member. But um, the, the farmers have to own their hemp. They have to own the products. Otherwise, they're serfs to the farmers as they've been since serfdom. So that was his message to me that I, I, I like uh, carrying forth. And it sure ain't easy, among other things. Once you decide you are the enterprise, oh, there's paperwork, there's liability, there's payroll if you're going to get into that that um, kind of enterprise. So it's um, it ain't easy, but it's um, I think it's the only way to success for most. There could be a model where let's start with seed. Now you asked about markets, right? So we're trying to create a a um, a food craze for hemp superfood, and hemp deserves it. Uh, nine to perfect nine to six to three ratio of omegas. Uh, um, beautiful um, uh, mil uh, mineral content not commonly found in uh, vegetarian and vegan foods, m magnesium, selenium, that kind of thing. Very high in protein. One of my varieties we tested a couple of years ago at 31% protein. 
Wow. It's um, it's an amazing thing, and I eat it. I've eaten it already today. I I eat it every day. It's a it's a it's a it's a superfood, and it deserves to be everywhere. Um, and I think it, it one day um will be, and um, and it's actually flying off shelves now in kind of this weird uh, lockdown economy. Hmm. And I urge anyone who's a customer always seek out organic. It's really important when you're eating any product, especially uh, hemp. It might work. For a farmer that's growing three sections in, in the Montanas or the North Dakotas of the world, to make a contract where they grow organically and get one or two dollars per pound for seed, let's even say one dollar per pound. I always want more for the farmer, but the average sort of good harvest nowadays is one thousand pounds per acre, meaning you're getting one thousand dollars per acre. And so, if you're on several acre, uh, several sections that are adding up to let's call it two thousand acres, that's a two million dollar harvest wholesale for you if you're if you have a reliable this is always the big question mark reliable buyer um and there are some for your for your harvest um there are some for organic i should say so you've got a two million dollar harvest you're already locked in you've been growing whatever gmo corner hemp or whatever a corner or soy or something so you've you've got the equipment maybe there maybe your equipment's kind of paid off and all of a sudden, you're healing the soil, growing organic, and obviously you want to clean that soil before you provide a food product, grow for several seasons uh, for phytoremediation. But, prior, but you know, you've got clean soil now, you're growing organic, you're certified, and you're getting a two million bucks for, I don't want to call it a 2,000 acre harvest of anything easy, but it's relatively low maintenance compared, and, and then you're done. You've dropped it off at the, silo, at the silo with the buyer, and you're done. Assuming honest working relationships and a good growing season, you're, you're, you're done with $2 million in the bank. So that's a potential market if you're not going to own your genetics. But I still think for most farmers, and even a large acreage farmer can reserve 20 prime acres and do their own value-added hedge for their own product. That's what I recommend for most farmers, which is own your seeds, own your, your, your product, and manufacture a regenerative product that's simply wonderful, just better than what anyone else is doing. There's so many things you can do. We're still on the seed side of the plant, but I'll tell you what I do. My product is called Hemp in Hemp, and it's very sim simple. Infusing the flower from a dioecious or seeded crop in the hemp seed oil from the same crop. As I expand, it's only some of the, of the seed oil is from the crop, but all of the flower is. Um, infusing it in organic hemp seed oil, and um, then you're getting a superfood from, from the seed oil, and the cannabinoids um, from the flower. A million other things you can do with seed products. You can use the hemp protein meal. That's, a, that's uh, the result after you press hemp seed oil. So there's a product right there. But you can use that, that uh, uh, high protein hemp powder for um, a uh, cereal product, a, uh, for humans, you know, a, a, a pancake mix, a, a toothpaste, a beauty care product. A, uh, I know my goats simply love this. And we're working towards final, um, uh, you know, universal approval for hemp as animal feed, but we'll, we'll get there very soon, and it's already there um, in some places. So um, that's just the seed part. You're, you know, it's what is your passion? Have you been sick of crappy toothpaste, and you want to make the world's best toothpaste? Do the numbers. Are there enough customers within three or five hundred miles of you? Where if you're in every organic food cop and hustling it at, at farmers markets and making a web pro presence and and hitting up your local media, can you be the the big hemp based toothpaste company of your region and make a good living for you, your family, and your farming community while healing soil? Please, please go for it. Switching to fiber um, as we move along the architecture of the plant. Personally, this isn't. I'm not saying this is the worldwide fiber boom. We're just giving some examples. Personally, I just can't wait to be done with plastic baling twine, plastic grain bags, plastic animal grain bags, and, 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 and my own harvest bags. Like, you don't want to store stuff in petrochemical junk. We're done with that. Uh, work on natural fibers for things like weed matting. Farmers, please don't plunk plastic sheeting down over your hemp. That's not, that's not how you want to feed people. Uh, and you'll notice if you listen to this whole hour, I don't say should do this very often, but let's keep the petrochemicals out of our farms. For, so anybody who gets into hemp, baling twine and hemp grain bags, please let me know because I'll be a customer and shout you out if you're doing it righteously. 
Um, switching kind of to the high tech side, we briefly uh, of fiber here still, we've alluded a little bit to supercapacitors. It's just super cool research going on that at the nano level, miracle of miracles, confirms one's religiosity um, or at least spiritualism, the hemp fiber at the one carbon level is outperforming any other known nanomaterial, some of them quite toxic, um, in next generation supercapacitors. The things that are gonna be charging by our solar panels, our homes, our farms, and our devices, of course, our vehicles. Um, this is wonderful because this rare earth stuff that feeds all our phones right now uh, and our other devices, that's that's got to evolve into a, a next generation thing because that's the moment our devices are not regenerative. And like everything else, they must be. So hemp and other biomaterials to the rescue. Last thing I'll say about fiber, uh, Ben, you mentioned in your question about um, you know facilities. How could farmers maybe do a fiber facility? The fiber side of the hemp plant is the hardest to launch at scale unless you're doing super high end for specialty textiles or to get someone for their, you know, hug guitars and ukuleles and small scale. Uh, you only need 10, 12 acres of hemp to, for instance, build the average size house. So it's legit for things like hemp herd, for hemp building regionally in an area. But for the really hemp at scale, we do need large acreage. And most of all, we do need, even at the smallest turnkey professional facility for fiber, five to $8 million investments to get these fiber facilities up. If there's great grant writers out there in your region, hey, maybe that's done. I know the money's there. Everybody says it. The money's there for grants, you know. Um, so if that's your great uh, ability, we need you. We need grant writers for regenerative farmer-owned hemp fiber cooperatives. Because the nice thing about fiber is even if you're going for it strictly for flour or seed or like I am a combination, you're left over with that fiber. You've got it, right? We're going to mix it here up with a little local uh, regional lime, hydrolyzed lime and patch some uh, – uh, uh, gaps in our door frames on our porch with, with hempcrete, right? But for scale, you want to have hemp herd in all the home supply stores in your region. We've got to have a big processing facility and um, everyone's got the fiber. So it's a reason for farmers who are like all humans, it's hard to corral them to co cooperate. Um, it's a, it's kind of a win-win bit of a chicken and egg stuff, but a lot of people are trying it. I'm really watching closely. I really want to see these kind of, um, uh, fiber cooperatives especially form all cooperatives but but farmer owned uh, from a region and I, I want to be part of them um, and I want to shout them out so that's that's a fiber and you can do mixed biomass this is kind of proof of concept in certain places in Europe it doesn't have to be high quality and it doesn't have to be only hemp where you're pulping fiber for either 3d printed plastics or or a next generation paper there's a lot of uh you know, uh, lunch material. We don't need styrofoam takeout boxes anymore, or, or plastic shopping bags, and that's where you get your hemp grain bags and and uh, baling twine from uh, too. So um, it's not easy to do it's restarting up these kind of industries, but uh, it's vital <laughs> for humanity's survival that we migrate to the biomaterials renaissance. That's fiber. Um, two other side parts of the hemp plant here quickly. Uh, we've talked fiber and seed. Let's move to flower. In the trichomes, these little beautiful mushroomy crystals in the tip of female hemp flowers. I've been examining mine with my trusty scope every day uh, prior to harvest to make sure they're ready. Um, the These are where the cannabinoids reside. They are There are more than 100 known cannabinoids in the plant, of which THC, CBD are very famous. To me, it's all about the architecture of these these cannabinoids with their terpenes, which we talked about earlier. That's going to give you a distinct property. Think high-end uh, cheese shops, high-end fine champagne and wine shops in Mendo in Napa counties, Sonoma, those kind of things. That's what our top shelf hemp is, top shelf hemp is going to be comprised of. These beautiful farmer products, sometimes not from flower only sensimia crops, but from dioecious male and female crops. My theory being, everybody's happier when they're dating. Uh, you get a totally different profile when a hemp plant has been fertilized, just like a mammalian female's body's chemistry changes when she becomes pregnant. So these are all things in their infancy in terms of research, but uh, um, valuable next generation products, certainly from the flower. What I'm looking for, if I'm not using my own product, is if I'm going to that fine hemp shop in, in anywhere from Slovenia to Botswana to, to Oregon to, to Tennessee, what I'm going for is 
hmm, okay, did the farmers from around here grow it? Is it certified organic? What's their backstory? Another Michael Pollan reference here, third one, I think. He says, you know, supermarket pastoral is like this story that makes you think that your free range chickens are going to be getting massages every day and swimming in jacuzzis. Tell your, your story on your product that why do I want to buy this Tennessee bottle of, of hemp massage oil, toothpaste, uh, cannabinoid balance tincture, whatever it is. And it, is it because you saw this odd uh, uh, cannabinoid, you know, unnamed cannabinoid number 42 in your hemp uh, uh, profile that you've never seen in any other hemp before? I want to know about that. And what does the research say about that? Tell your story in that fine hemp shop or at that farm stand, at that farmer's market, and then I'm going to be your customer. Last side of the plant here. We've done flour, we've done seed, we've done fiber. Phytoremediation, that, that comes from the roots. By the way, you can make the leaves into wonderful teas and going way back in the European tradition, Middle Ages, the root uh, uh, side of the plant that we're talking about is totally distinct in its properties and was used and, and you know, there's another opportunity for fo folks to study the old herbal books, the old midwifery books about hemp and roots and what they were used for. But right now I'm going to be talking about hemp's roots as phytoremediation. This can be defined as either soil building or soil cleanup. We know that much of the world's soil is stressed. Hemp plays a role in that phytoremediation in some incredible ways and some very, uh, one of my other sort of guys that I really rely on uh, was always telling me in some very ordinary ways. Um, so I'll talk about this, but first I want to say I'm really proud that um, this hemp variety that I've been developing here in New Mexico and elsewhere was shown just recently, just a month or two ago, um, in preliminary research out of New Mexico State University, this variety I've been growing, the, the hemp does all the work, I'm just a midwife, but I'm still very proud, has been shown to be um, cleaning um, radioactive uranium from contaminated mining soil that uh, originated in the Four Corners region uh, of my state up in, uh, uh, north uh, in uh, northwest New Mexico, so I'm very proud about that uptake. the The next story is okay. Well, what's what do you do once there's a, an uptake? And that's a very big discussion. Um, and I think um, we humans are up to that challenge of rendering various classes of toxins, and they're all distinct. There might be radioactivity. There might be uh, uh, petrochemical pollution. There might be uh, 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 pesticide herbicide uh, intrusion. Right. There's so many different kinds of things and the remedies are distinct. Um, mycological solutions might come in with basically creating industrial kind of uh, sized composting where uh, uh, once you've sucked up with hemp and other biomaterials, toxic materials from soil, how you can render them inert. But I will say, I mentioned in, in, in American Hemp Farm, research done by um, um, a, a colleague and friend, um, Professor Jing Lee of University of Hawaii, that's showing in certain kinds of uh, phytoremediation work he's been doing, preliminary, again, preliminary studies, hemp is actually taking the toxic atrazine, the, the herbicide that's been pulling up successfully and, and rendering in some cases inert after a certain amount of time. So it's actually having uh, biochemical changes on certain types of toxins where, so hemp is starting the process of actually not just removing from the soil, but removing the toxin to begin with. So Phytoremediation is wonderful. And I want to stress too, hemp wants nutrients in the soil. You want to build your soil. It's not that hemp is a magic soil cleanup. There's many plants that clean up soil. But in terms of your and my crop, ideally, if we have a wonderful garden or field that's already healthy, you know, no toxins in it, does hemp help that soil? Yes, it helps that soil in that with its long tap roots, especially, it creates a... Um, mechanically creates, you know, not magically blinking like a genie, it mechanically creates through its tap roots an aeration process that allows the other good microorganisms that you are encouraging in your soil and building in your soil um, to thrive and find a home. But hemp, like many crops, also does want good minerals and good nutrients in the soil. So Think about building, number one, like it's off season now, we just harvested, I'm already thinking about, okay, time to plant that overwintering nitrogen building vetch clover crop over the winter, for instance. Um, so I'll stop there and say, those are the four sides of the plants and various markets that I might uh, see for them into the future. Well, thanks for that. 
So to me, it seems like the U.S. government is allowing the hemp market to exist, but there doesn't seem to be uh, a lot of leadership there. I mean, China, for example, dominates the fiber market for hemp, but I don't really see the USDA, for example, jumping in to challenge that in any way. I don't see any Earl Butts-like proclamations calling from, for hemp from fence row to fence row. Is, is that a good or bad thing? Or is that even an accurate assessment? As always, it's just such a good question, Ben. So um, I want to start with the second half of it. Of, you know, is it is it a good thing? Uh, and is it not? it's an accurate assessment in a sense. But if it were even more so, if it was just all right, yeah, Congress said, you know, go for it. It's tomatoes, go for it. Actually, yeah, the less the better. This I'm speaking here for the independent regenerative niche here. Yeah. yeah, the less regulation, the better. Again, yes, we all want best practices. Yes, we all want safe foods. But the BS, let me, <clears throat> let me be more kind and positive <laughs> and then probably more accurate and say the overburdening direction that food regulation is taking, I'm speaking just on the food spot side right now, see, the seed side of the plant, like hemp is you know, in the food stream like everything else. It doesn't make food safer, and it's so overburdening. It's so geared intentionally towards large producers. It's so difficult. Everything from ridiculous things like, you know, building a bathroom for inspectors is required in certain parts of the food system. Even if you're like a, a, a local dairy raw milk person that has three cows, like it's it, it's completely insane. And and so in in American Hemp Farmer, I talk about this where I ask people that are already large scale, um, independent regenerative uh, hemp folks, and I'm thinking of Roger Gushis, my colleague at Healthy Hemp Seeds in North Dakota, who just is, it's just never ends. He said his wife and his sister are both, their job is just all the paperwork and inspections and stuff. And, and it would be, again, one thing if the food system were getting safer and people were getting healthier, you'd say, look, it works, right? It doesn't work. It's, it's not to even, you, I, I just watched an old episode of Star Trek where Mr. Spock Riley suggests that the purpose of bureaucracies is to make things not work. I wouldn't go that far. I, I really think, for instance, at the federal level, when I speak to the, in this early, early age of the hemp industry and hemp renaissance and legalization, when I speak to folks very high up in, in the USDA and involved in hemp regulation, they're, they're, they're one of us. They want it to work as human beings, you know? Um, so I think, and I think we're being listened to, um, to, a, to a large degree. Um, but so to answer your second part of your question of, you know, is this a good thing that hemp isn't, uh, getting too much attention? I would say, I wish it was getting less regulatory <laughs> attention right. than it is. It, and the fact, so then moving to the second half of like, okay, so where, what, you know, what does that look like and where is it going? And from the regulatory standpoint, you know, um, we are very close to the comment limit for the first round of the official hemp everyone thing we all ask for get us we shouldn't be regulated by law enforcement and justice department control something like that's insane this is one of humanity's longest utilized most useful plants it's it's so it's beyond harmless it's so beneficial get us out of that and so boom they took hemp out but a certain weird low de thc definition which we'll get past. but we're out of it we're in agriculture we're regulated tomatoes yay this is what we want we're tomatoes and so the first usda sort of draft rules your comment period uh, recently extended is ending tomorrow, but probably after this this podcast ask, uh, airs, and it's completely unworkable. It's it's uh, it's not at all um, what the industry needs, and and part of this is showing that hemp really is getting awareness because the USDA, if you consider the Secretary of Agriculture, the head of USDA, he gets it. This guy, uh, Secretary Purdue has been grilled about this before Congress and his predecessor, before he quit, said this whole hemp business, uh, it's all I'm getting asked about, the most common thing I'm getting asked hmm. about in Capitol Hill. People recognize how important this is and Congress has been very supportive in giving us regenerative independent farmers what we want. And the regulatory level, it's, it, it was not a good launch in terms of what they're calling the interim final regulations or, or rules at IFR. And um, they know it. When asked about it, Secretary Purdue was like, yeah, we kind of like went back and asked the guys in Justice Department and the Drug Enforcement Administration what, you know, we gave them a courtesy read and they gave us lots of comments that we kind of just implemented, you know? And, and so just to give you a, a few, you know, any 
restriction on farmers growing any crop is insane. It's anti-American, and it's an, and I don't use the word insane lightly. And, um, and it's 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 uh, it's 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 a violation of human rights. No one's going to tell my family or yours what they can put and grow on the ground. But um, within that realm of accepting for now this insanity of hemp having any regulation at all, especially to farmers, this annual stress of getting this THC test, our grandchildren will look back on it and laugh. I'm so glad my kids are old enough to be conscious of it so they it won't seem like just the babbling of an old man with the grandkids on my knee. They'll be like, no, this is true. Government came, it was the only time almost anyone ever came onto our ranch was the government came to test our hemp crop every year for this one kind of because it used to be this war on cannabis it'll be in crazy talk to our grandkids like segregation is crazy talk just like just you know people saying yeah you're we couldn't certain people a certain shade of melanin on their skin couldn't drink out of a water fountain in a certain place and for for a hundred years like that's just people won't be able to believe that hemp was 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 banned for that long it's a human rights thing in that in that same category or even that it was restricted or tested but in the real world the usda now um in the first round has these just crazy provisions in there and again the individuals care and they want to make it right in the usda they're good people and they will make it right i'm convinced um but among the really crazy things one of them is um you know we have this right now we have this definition of hemp as thc of 0.3 percent or less Right. It's insane. The farmer shouldn't be tested at all, but hemp wants more than 0.3. Hemp has evolved with THC for a reason. The Chinese textile, textile market leads the world because they don't care about THC and their hemp flowers because they're marketing the fiber and they know that a balanced plant is going to have stronger fiber. Um, and this, this carries through to all sides of the plant. If you're not growing for the flower specifically, you still want THC in your plant because in the flower because it will make your seeds many farmers including myself believe more believe more nutritious more protein packed and none of that thc is in the actual seed that anyone would eat so it's irrelevant what the thc level is in the flower now of course if you want to market that flower sure the processing facility ideally still farmer owned before it goes to retail should be tested and if that state the fed not the feds but the state says okay that that thc is three percent in that test that's still not we don't worry about that don't worry about it over say five percent we consider that um needs to be regulated either through the medicinal market or the adult social market um but this 0.3 percent it's crazy it's got to go everyone knows it right now there's a massive effort on to get at least the initial change to one percent that that solves the big problem that farmers are having with testing hot up to 40 percent of tests when we say hot over 0.3 percent thc in their official unnecessary tests but usually, almost always, 90% of the time, under 1%. So 1% will solve most of the problem until we get the whole thing changed where there's no difference between hemp and cannabis on the federal level, and farmers can grow whatever they want, and it's never tested until the final move to retail. For, for, the burden's totally off the farmer. But with law enforcement input, which wasn't even supposed to be part of the hemp pro project anymore, that's the whole point of legalizing it, that's the whole point of making it like tomatoes, Law enforcement asked USDA to start saying your negligence, federal risk for federal prosecution uh, comes at 0.35%. That is, that's a non-starter. It shouldn't be in there at all. The Fed shouldn't be talking about negligence. That should be a state issue. But ugh, it should be about intent, uh, as my good friend Carrie Jaguer, who manages Vermont's uh, Best in Nation hemp program, puts it. It should be about, not about numbers, but intent. And if you have to set numbers, ugh, move the decimal point or, or move it several points, like 0.35%, you're putting sweat on farmers for this industry that should be supported. Insane, gotta go. Everyone knows it. And if you want proof that everyone knows that these initial USDA regs are unworkable, last week signed into law, this is federal law, we've extended an earlier, better pre-USDA version of the hemp program that states can now do for yet another season so we know we've got to leapfrog these these initial uh, USDA regulations, and even USDA, I think, knows it. Uh, another unworkable aspect of the current uh, interim final rules that the USDA has put forth, a 15-day window between getting your harvest test back, right? Yay, 0.2% THC, we are legal, our family can make a living this year. 
15 days to harvest. It's insane. The Fed should not even be talking about days to harvest. They don't know what farming conditions are like in New Mexico, Hawaii, Guam, and other places that are regulated by U.S. law. Huge differences in how plants mature. Uh, yeah, there should be no federal definition at all. But if there is, 75 days or 60 days at most mm -hmm. should be the, the difference. So all this looking back and worrying about THC, that was Department of Justice, DEA folks who are great folks doing their job. And I know they're fighting the opioid epidemic hard and, and, and the meth problem and, and all the pharmaceutical problems. I know they're working hard on that. And, and I really, truly appreciate this. I know DEA agents, but the DEA is out of hemp and soon out of cannabis. And uh, before the USDA makes any rules, it should be thinking about how to build what I, my goal is, <laughs> which is 230 million acres of domestic hemp. That is the amount of hemp that will equal today's combination of corn, wheat, cotton, and soy. You know, the, the fact that THC levels uh, play a role in the quality of the plant and its structure is something I, I learned only recently, and I don't think most people understand that. Um, because of current regulations on THC in hemp plants, um, does that mean that we're developing kind of crappy genetics? I'm, pro I'm glad to say, for the most part, for independent farmers, the answer to that is no, because we're not, uh, abandoning all for this ridiculous um, uh, temporary 0.3% definition. There are there are entities that have been working to, to sh develop and shout out, oh, we've developed absolute 0% THC. That, if you want Diet Coke or Cab, um, yeah, go for it. But that's, in my view, not, it's not what I want from any food. I want a whole plant product from a healthy plant uh, developed from an heirloom variety that's been around for a really long time. That's, that's what I'm looking for um, in what I want to cultivate. And that's what I'm looking for in any product for which I'm a customer. I'm not looking for new miracle ingredient X349 that for counterproductive reasons takes out something that, that the plant wants that my body wants. Like that's, you know, that's, that's, that's just completely the wrong way to go. And, but I think everybody recognizes it. Re regulators recognize it. I was talking about Vermont's uh, great program, by the way, I cultivate under a really good and supportive program here in New Mexico as well. Farmers can own their genetics easily. And, you know, they do the best to make it work uh, uh, in terms of uh, how it works with sampling and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Vermont's the best. And one of the things Vermont uh, has, I believe in its new draft regs, is they're not interested really in even testing dioecious crops, meaning male and female crops. Those are the crops that are grown for food primarily mm -hmm. and for fiber. Just like China doesn't worry about it, right? Vermont's not going to worry about it if you're seeded. Um, I love that. I personally still use the flower part of my seeded crop. I, like I said, I like to brag that, uh, you know, maybe there's a balance element. Who knows? There's just something I like about this idea of, you know, everybody's happier when they're dating fertilized crops. It's just what I like. It's not necessarily what everybody will, will want. Maybe so, maybe not. But mm -hmm. Vermont recognizes THC burden in general is going away. Um, Vermont has a combined THC 1% in their hemp program now. Um, and that still works within 0.3 federal because they're interpreting it as 0.3% of this one thing, Delta THC, which is active THC. And they're right about it. Uh, about that, but combined with the other types of THC, you're allowed to get uh, up to 1% in Vermont. So th these are game winning programs when it explains why Vermont has one of the highest per capita programs. It's farmers are free to develop the genetics that they want. Eventually it's not going to be limited to 1%. It's going to be just what is best for the application um, that, that you're trying to develop. You mentioned Vermont, but are there countries that have hemp policies and programs in place that you think the U S could learn from. One thing is it'd be good for us to join the 1% team, Thailand, Switzerland, uh, two parts of Australia, Tasmania and Western Australia. Who am I forgetting? Um, Zimbabwe. I've, 
I'm not, my, not mistaken. Is that right? What I forgot. I'm pretty sure that's the one or two countries in Africa have defined their hemp as uh, as one percent. Oh, Ecuador is another one. South America. One percent is their definition of th uh, of the THC level in hemp. Again, that's just a start. But yeah, we're joining the one percent club uh, along with Vermont and others. Um, yeah, we just got to stop worrying about THC. The war on cannabis is over. Uh, cannabis won. You look at a state like Vermont, uh, sorry, a state like Oregon, which has very strong political cannabis political presence, a very strong cannabis lobby in, within its state and a, a, a national leader in cannabis legalization in their congressional delegation, especially Congressman Earl Blumenauer, also Senator Ron Wyden. And um, they're so far ahead that Oregon has already passed a law saying as soon as it's legal in the receiving end, it's legal for Oregon farmers to export their psychoactive cannabis mm. to other states and other countries where that's legal in Oregon as soon as the receiving party's ready. So in Oregon, I'm guessing if folks want Oregon genetics, which they should, in Uruguay, let's say a country where it's legal, or Portugal, cannabis is fully legal. They, they can already do international business, even though we haven't legalized cannabis on the federal level yet psychoactive cannabis we will real soon but oregon sees the writing on the wall the train has left the station regulating hemp at all let alone at the farmer level is it's a tiny short-lived thing we're almost done with it um quick note on how the point three thing happened throughout history there's been no delineation between hemp and cannabis and as we've been discussing today the eventual goal is again no no delineation it's just cannabis and you grow as a farmer and the only time it will ever matter what the thc content is of your flower is if your product is going to the retail market. So you're never worried with your burden, never burdened with the test on the farm. Um, even if it's a farmer owned entity, it'll be first harvested, brought, brought to storage and processing. And that's, if there's any test, if there's any government coming onto your land or your property, it'll be there. Um, uh, and that's only if you're marketing a flower pr product, otherwise it's, it's completely irrelevant. Um, so, but at the moment we have this artificial delineation and it kind of got its official start in 1976 from a Canadian paper in which the researchers used the word random. We, we randomly, or sorry, no, sorry, they used the word arbitrary. We arbitrarily chose 0.3% as a delineation between the cannabis and the hemp. Um, you know, so when Kentucky, for instance, was leading the world in the early 20th century with its hemp genetics, no one was testing for THC. Um, and as no one is uh, in China today. So, um, that's a re an arbitrary, unworkable level. The plant wants more than that in it, no matter, almost no matter what you're growing for. A healthy, kind of balanced cannabis plant has evolved for thousands and thousands of years <laughs> with its cannabinoid balance for the healthy plant. Trying to remove it, it would be like trying to remove lycopene from tomatoes, you know, or some of the beneficial elements from a tomato plant. Um, because theoretically, if someone concentrated and drink, drank it, they might get drunk or something like that. It's just, it's completely just based on a drug war that's over. Um, and that, yeah, as I said, the trains left the station, cannabis is back, and that's a good thing. Well, so I'm curious, because I haven't really thought about it before, but if um, psychoactive cannabis was legalized on a federal level, how would that change the landscape? Because right now you have people who are growing hemp for seed, for flour, for fiber, et cetera, et cetera. But if 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 uh, psychoactive cannabis was was legalized, what would what would that do? I mean, ha have you war game that at all? I mean, how would that change the market? Absolutely. It, in my view, it just furthers this end game that we have. I think as regenerative independent hemp farmers, which is make our hemp irrelevant at the farm level because all cannabis is legal. Every state now has its regulatory process. So if your flower, female flower is the only time any kind of regulation would ever come into play um, for cannabis hemp, other than standard food stuff like making sure your food is safe, as we talked about, getting, getting into the market if you're marketing your seed or whatever, seed or flower for, for edible. But female flower is the only part of the plant that theoretically can have THC in it. So when all cannabis is legal, the state's going to say, okay, above 5% makes it regulate, regulation ready for our adult social use or medicinal markets. So all that means is 
Now, no farmer of any kind of cannabis is ever tested in the field. The only time they're ever tested is after harvest, if you have a female flower product that's going to go out to the public. So the hemp, if you're only marketing a hemp seed product, your flowers are relevant. If you're only marketing a hemp fiber product, your flowers are relevant. If you're marketing a flower product, that's only relevant if it's over your state delineated level um, of THC. The feds have no difference of the definition between cannabis and hemp anymore. It's all just cannabis and it's regulated by states. That, that's the end game. And it, cannabis, full cannabis legalization, which is coming very soon, is, um, is going to further that. Because it's how absurd would it be to have legal cannabis and, and like these tests? What, what would happen? So let's say we raise the THC level to 1%, which of course is not the final level. Uh, my farming organization, the National Farmers Union, advocates 3% as the definition of hemp. Let's say it goes to 3%. You have a test and you test at 4%. What, what's the penalty? Your state's cannabis is legal. There's 30% available down the street. Yeah. At the high end cannabis craft market, what, what's what's the regulation on your four percent THC? Yeah, that, all that nonsense of testing low THC hemp farms is going away. Hmm. Your book is, in many ways, a, a collection of stories about the various personalities and pioneers who are growing hemp in the U.S. and elsewhere. Um, I'd love it if you could introduce our listeners to some of these some of these people. Who stands out in your mind? First and foremost, I'm so glad after sequestering carbon, because I got into hemp for, for a fairly intense reason, as I'll mention here in a second if folks haven't read the book yet. But um, other than carbon sequestration, the, the greatest blessing in my life from hemp, which is saying a lot because there's many, we already talked about the terpenes in my nostrils right now as we speak, post-harvest, surrounded by, by the harvest right now. But the greatest benefit has been the people that I've met that I would not otherwise of men. And I suppose, you know, a dentist could say that too, right? I mean, anybody that comes in, there'll be a wide range of interesting people, but um, boy, boy, oh boy, I've met some just fantastic and interesting people and also been placed in very interesting situations. I was really lucky for several years to be the lead consultant on a Native American project for the Colville tribe and, and having the elders of the tribe come down and bless this plan and talk about how important it is as, um, is memorable. Yeah. Um, a cast of characters, I, I think of my colleague Edgar Winters. He's um, probably at this point, if not the most longest cultivating living hemp farmer among them, because he's pushing 70 and he first cultivated hemp as a very small child in the 50s with, with his grandfather. We were talking about, um, this was in Alabama, we were talking about uh, earlier today been in the in the podcast about um how much i'd love to get rid of hemp uh, how much i'd love to get rid of plastic baling twine and ret return it to natural fibers that idea besides how grossed out i am by all the plastic piling up everywhere on farms everywhere um came because edgar's grandfather saw a marketing advantage for their cotton crop in alabama by continuing it was like a brand to be continuing to grow their hemp for fiber for baling twine when everybody was moving to this plastic junk and he mm -hmm. knew hemp outperformed it. It was a performance thing. It was a branding thing. And so that's where Edgar first cultivated. And then when he was in the military, he got stationed in Spain for a while and his girlfriend's father was a hemp farmer. So he learned how to grow hemp for food. And this is in the sixties now, right? And then, uh, and then our 60s and 70s. And then he went minute that Oregon legalized where he lives now, he was got hemp permit number one. And he became one of my closest friends and mentors. And I write about him a lot in the book. And I'm working on a TV version of the of the of the book, American Hemp Farmer, um, where he's kind of the, my go-to guy whenever there's a question or a problem because he he's just one of the most experienced guys. He's also just he's so knowledgeable, and he does come from a soil loving, soil understanding perspective. So he's been he's he and his wife are the guys who really or the people who have taught me about you know taking that tiny little tiny brush out and brushing the little globules of pollen that you've saved in the fridge of the plant of the male plants that you liked on the female plants that you like the next season innumerable lessons in the ground which i've taught to many people elsewhere but it's just so fun being around him because he like uh yogi berra and and, and both george bush's before him is one of the world's great malapropists and he just 
has many of which I've written about um, in the book. He just has so many just brilliant, phrase, unintentionally poetic phrases that come about uh, that just fly out of his mouth where when I'm in the field with him, my family is expecting texts of the latest Edgarism. Um, and so just to, to give you one now, there's, oh gosh, there's, there's um, uh, so many of them, but one of them that's, that's family friendly is um, one time I said, gosh, you know, do we want to plant as wide as we have been growing these giant redwood hemp stalks with this variety or plant really tighter. Maybe it won't produce as much per plant, but maybe we'll get more and we'll have an easier hand harvest trying to be petroleum free with our harvest. And Edgar goes with his, in his, he's still got the Alabama patient kind of accent. He goes, yeah, it's probably 50 of one, half a dozen of another. <laughs> so there's a million Edgarisms I could tell you, but um yeah, just wonderful, you know, wonderful people. I, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah. Um, so you have a new online learning course on growing hemp. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, and I and I should say you've worked with Acres USA to produce that. Um, you did most of the work. But um, what are you hoping people who take the course get from it? Thanks for that. And yes, we work closely with Acres and also significantly with you specifically and and i really appreciated your guidance um oh you're welcome there are a lot of pundits out there in the world that don't do the actual thing that they're writing about right there's like critic syndrome mm-hmm. and so uh, i try to minimize that in my work and in almost all the books going back to i mean you can see the titles not really an alaskan mountain man farewell my Subaru going back to everything that I've ever tried to do in my life as a guy who grew up in the suburbs where I was kind of raised like you know become a professional let other people do the actual stuff you know so you could use your mind or whatever it is and I I love using the minds don't get me wrong but I I don't have a huge skill set on like the actual mechanics of of (laughs) survival in life so my whole kind of career uh, from a journalistic and literary perspective has been, I'm this guy just like you. I'm this every man uh, who humorously doesn't know what he's getting into, whether it's living in rural Alaska and trying to learn um, how, to, how, to, how to acquire food or, or chop wood uh, through um, uh, how to install solar panels or get outsmarted by goats. Um, and now uh, how to you know cultivate hemp or any crop successfully, especially when it comes to, to plants i totemically i've always been i i've thought always been more of an animal guy you know um milk and goats over the years in the family i like to think i'm the guy that uh you know if, if natalie merchant or one of our other goats all of whom are named after singers bet midler it's a, being um rambunctious on the milking stand i can go and you know vulcan mind meld with them and, and calm them down and get them milked or whatever um but boy hemp is hemp cannabis has been a real eye-opener for me about plant intelligence and has been my entree into seeing just how amazing plants are um, and what good friends they are in, 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 in very concrete and real, real ways. You know, if you help one, they, if you help them, they, they give back so much, so much more. So the, all of this is a preface to the he- regenerative hemp course that you mentioned in that I'm telling the story of a guy who's done it all from acquiring genetics and building soil through harvesting, packaging, and marketing, not at massive levels. And I'm not claiming to be an expert at any or all of these areas, but at least I've done it. And I know the questions to ask. And some of the time I feel like I have a decent answer. I can tell you, I'll give you two quick practical points in terms of the cultivation side. Just now having gone through harvest, the first and most important thing that most folks don't know in their first hemp harvest, especially if it's a dioecious you know, seed crop, is you've got to get those seeds dried down to 8% really, really quickly. Hemp is a really warm, temper, hot temperature crop when you harvest it, and you can lose a lot of your harvest if you don't get the seed cleaned and dried immediately. And so the course in that in the harvest chapter talks about the mechanics of, you know, the really what do you want to do and have ready before harvest so you're not scrambling to get it down. Likewise, planting time on the other end, early season, it's not that, you know, it's not crazy rocket science as long as you've spent months, uh, you know, building the soil, which we also cover, but 
when it's actual planting day, just a half inch depth and, and you want good uh, soil, to, soil to seed contact and some moisture at right at germination, but not a wet feed afterwards. It's not a big rocket science thing, right? And the, the book covers that stuff. I mean, sorry, the, the course covers that stuff. But in the cases where I don't consider myself the world expert, let's say real the technical side of soil building or strategies for marketing at a, at a slightly larger scale than the 1,000 unit runs that I do with my own product, I've brought in people that we have video interviews with in the course. So in that sense, the overall takeaway, I think, is you get a real start to finish perspective on a regenerative hemp small acreage season, 20, let's say 20 acres are left or under, um, especially if you're a large acre farmer, you might find it all useful too. But um, from, from the very beginning of genetics and soil building through the harvesting season, through planting, harvest, uh, packaging, storage, uh, processing, processing like a shaman, as I like to say, and, and marketing and regenerative marketing and, and end game and, and, and all that, uh, plus some legal and, and, and um, uh, uh, legislative rege regulatory primers and stuff like that. So it's, it's comprehensive whether you want to do this kind of as a backyard farmer, because even if you do, you have to get today, insanely enough, a permit, even if you want to just grow for your own family's food or fiber uh, or cannabinoid um, uh, diet. And uh, if you certainly if you want to be an entrepreneur, it's geared um, toward for, to the regenerative entrepreneur as well. And uh, as you mentioned, offered through uh, acres.com. And uh, I'm presuming it's pretty easy to find in the education uh, part of the acres website. You know, so many people who know what they're talking about when it comes to hemp, um, their advice, and, and that includes you, um, is start small. Talk a little bit about the importance of starting small and what that means to you. It's essential for so many reasons. If you have never cultivated hemp before, the first season or so, I've learned something from every hemp harvest. You'll probably do a good job if you built your soil, acquired good genetics, you know, paid attention. You have a good shot at the very first crop looking great. But still, you learn so much from being in that field every day. You've just absolutely got to do it. And so if you're, if you're in a position where you have large acreage, even 10, but let alone 50 or more acres. And there, there's mostly good reasons for starting small, that one to three to five acres in your first season. Let's just say to some degree, you've hit the jackpot in the sense of a perfect situation. The, the folks that own, you know, 40 natural food stores in your state and surrounding states, you're gonna keep it regional, they want your organic hemp, they're willing to pay you a good price for some part of it up front. you know, your final bottled product if it's a cannabinoid, product, so something like that. Even then, if it's your first year, I would suggest keeping it relatively small. One acre, if you're growing for primarily for flour, produces a huge amount of flour. The market is not asking for hugely more than that, generally speaking, from a first season crop, but even if, it is, you're putting yourself at a large risk if you grow, especially in one spot, one cultivar on that amount of acreage. Um, so starting small is, is, is smart for a lot of reasons. For most people, you also don't have that pre-buying setup. Hopefully you're gonna work very hard in that. As the hemp course uh, talks about, you've gotta work really hard during this, before, during, and after the season to find the places where, you're, where your product, if you're gonna be an entrepreneur, where it's gonna end up. And it's very doable, both digitally and, and, and in, in stores and that kind of thing, but it's hard work and it can take several years. So there's, there's so many good reasons, but just from a mother nature and learning the plant perspective, I'll give an example um, of consulting clients slash colleague friends of mine in Arkansas this year. They really wanted to do sensomia for flower for most of their, pro actually they wanted to do dioecious, but because of the 0.3 ridiculousness in hemp, I was cautious to move any of my genetics until we're at 1% just because it's, I've always, when I've cultivated my genetics, always passed my THC tests. But because it's so easy to go over 0.3, 0.3 is nothing. 1% is nothing, people. 3% is nothing, people. It's so easy to have normal fluctuations along those lines in any crop, but in, in hemp, 
depending on even what time of day your test is conducted, let alone the soil and what your phyto period is. So you get it, right? So wait, so I'm, I was hesitant to provide them my dioecious crops. So they're like, okay, we're just going to grow. We're going to grow uh, um, sensimia seed only, female only, and grow for cannabinoids this year. See what does well here on three acres. Smart move, right? So they, I refer to them, people that I, uh, uh, I'm confident in that have reliable genetics of that type, because I'm not the type of genetics I do. And they get the crazy southern her uh, hurricane that's affected so much of the U.S. South uh, in this 2020 growing season. Just really hurt a lot of plants. And it came at a bad time. Their plants are in full flower. And um, so they're, they're, you know, we're FaceTiming and showing show me photos and I see what's going on. Here's what happened in their crop, which wiped oh, out a huge part of the southern U.S. hemp crop this year. One of their cultivars, un touch they couldn't even get to the crop for a week and a half because it was so rainy and muddy and hurricaney they couldn't get trucks anywhere close they tried to walk in they sank down to their knee whatever right mm -hmm. um you know the joy of, of being a farmer they finally get there they find one of the two cultivars they uh acquired unaffected doing great looking beautiful and one of them about i forgot if it was 30 40 50 percent seriously impacted by botrytis or bud bud rot you know mm -hmm. really damaged um and they sort of, they knew exactly, they took my advice at the beginning, they followed it, they saw why, and they understood. Like, came, they came to me like, hey, what do you think we can do? Anything we can do? Like, a, there's a lot of caterpillars on the damaged crop. Is there anything we can do at this point? Kind of stuff. They, they didn't want to lose half, you know, basically you could call 25% of their crop, half of one of their cultivars. But the lesson was exactly what everyone set out to do which was learn the first year cultivars that might be hardy in your very wet climate if there's a worst case scenario, inundation, a hurricane. And boy, they learned. Does that mean that other crop is going to be the long-term, always the way to go? No, it might mean if they had grown the second crop with some dioecious and, and, and replicated the ones that survived, the 50% that survived, those might be the hardiest one. It, being Gregor Mendel is not easy, but uh, it is, I will say this, Ben, getting out, and farming is the most fun you can have outside the bedroom. There you go. Well, to wrap things up a little bit, I'm, I'm interested in getting an update on the scientific study of cannabis. Um, more folks are studying the plant's impact on human health. Um, and I'm not just talking about psychoactive, I'm talking about non psychoactive cannabis. Um, what, what are they, what are they finding? Um, because, I mean, earlier you were talking about hemp as superfood, and I'm interested in hearing more about what people are discovering. Thanks for that. So I'm going to focus on one kind of cool thing that I've discovered uh, from researching researchers of colleagues um, uh, on the food side, the seed side, um, more so than, than the flower side, um, just because I'm more knowledgeable. But I will say this about the flower side of the plant. So by now, uh, folks, many folks probably came in familiar with cannabis hemp life cycle and architecture. But again, for those who are new to it, you grow the hemp plant and there's four sides, four parts of that plant, right? Seed, and that's if you grow male and female, the males fertilize the female flowers and seeds grow. So you have seed, superfood. Flower, female flower, primarily contains cannabinoids uh, 110 plus known cannabinoids and associated terpenes and the impacts of them, all these different ones, especially as they interact with each other, known as the entourage effect. Really interesting studies coming out on can certain cannabinoids other than the ones that have been getting the early headlines. Um, and then, of course, fiber and then root, and there's also leaves, right? But we'll just be talking about uh, um, research now. When you want to study the research on the roots, look for 16th century, 12th century, that kind of thing. Um, European and, and Asian uh, writings on uh, impacts and benefits of the root part of the hemp plant. But for mm. seed and flower, flower, you know, once CBD started to get the big news, and then plus, of course, everyone knows THC from psychoactive cannabis. This year, a different cannabinoid among the 110, CBG was kind of uh, talked about as a big thing which is uh, associated, I've seen a few studies, I'm not an expert in all this, do your research folks, um, but a few things associated with sort of energy, energy increase, but also I think a, there's been a few cancer studies on, on both CBG and CBN. Then there's CBC, a cannabinoid I didn't even know existed until I saw it come back in, in my own genetics uh, testing and looked into it. It's associated with relaxation, antispasmosity in some early studies. So 
all kinds of cool stuff coming on the flower, uh, on the flower. But for my own purposes, I'm blessed that I and those that I, I love um, are not plagued by anything that requires curing, meaning looking for strictly medicinal things that may have very high levels of certain cannabinoids or a certain cannabinoid ratio. I'm going for health, maintenance, wellness, and that is a combination of cannabinoids that naturally in a plant where I ideally grow it. If you can't be the person who's growing it, then look in your, in your region, but it, you know, you ideally are, 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 are attuned to your own ecosystem in terms of your body's metabolism, metabolism if you're e eating regionally. And um, so I'm more interested in the entourage effect of, of many cannabinoids and terpenes than the individual milligrams per serving level of any one cannabinoid. So I hope that's enough to set folks off to do their own research on the flower side of the plant and um, uh, can, uh, entourage effect of many cannabinoids and terpenes, or uh, God forbid, if you've got some ailment or someone you love does, and you've heard maybe CBD is good for this kind of epilepsy or maybe cytotoxic right. to this kind of tumor. Um, um, yeah. Do the research, consult with medical professionals. I'm certainly not a medical professional, um, but you know, be diligent. Um, I will say that many of the stories that I've heard about cannabis is Gosh, I wish I hadn't waited so long in terms of my loved one along in this disease. But um, um, yeah, so uh, good luck with those kind of and blessings on that kind of research um, and be diligent. The seed side, another uh, health maintenance thing. We already talked earlier in the podcast about the known nutritive benefits, the, the omega balance, high protein level, high mineral content, magnesium, selenium that kind of thing. It's a superfood. One is wise, in my opinion, to eat every day. And I do. Um, again, everyone's body's different. So some people might not like it, might not like the taste, might whatever. I love it. And uh, don't know what I'd do without it because it's a major part of my diet. And that was before um, my University of Hawaii colleague, um, Ching Lee, did some preliminary research that uh, a hemp diet might inhibit. Uh, this is something I write about in American Hemp Farmer if you want to hear more about this, might inhibit um, the growth of lipid cells. In other words, it might help fight obesity. Um, so I'm all into this sort of hemp keeps you thin. Let's make a diet craze, uh, you know, Atkins type thing. And I am willing to, you know, be the before and after guy because I eat a lot of hemp and I would be a lot fatter, I guess, if I didn't. Because I also really enjoy, you know, things like raw cacao and things that have fat in them. <laughs> right. So I didn't know all these years, maybe it was my high hemp diet that was keeping me from being a lot um, more Homer Simpson shaped than I am. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, not a lot of people are eating hemp seed on a regular basis. Um, I guess one question would be why not, but how do you see hemp as food? evolving um is it is it going to, going to go beyond selling you know hemp heart seeds uh in in bulk or incorporating into granola where do you see that taking off another great question and this is also addressed in in american hemp farmer in conversations with some of the leaders on the food side among them roger gushes of healthy oil seeds in north dakota whom we've discussed in chad rosen of victory hemp foods kentucky and elsewhere um uh, and there are other good early food providers as well, especially organic minded folks. But those two are the guys that I've talked to most um, for the book and, and I've worked with both of them. And, um, so this is a, an important discussion. The exact question you ask, how does that food market evolve? And there's a range of possibilities that uh, uh, the realist and the optimist, you know, the blend um, see. First and foremost, we're super early in the market, as with everything in hemp. A uh, Canadian study a couple of years ago showed, you know, less than 1% of Americans have had any kind of hemp food product at all um, in their homes. So it's not yet a staple part of the diet, but we've had fast um, recognition of other superfoods in recent years. Uh, I, for one, am convinced that if we do get that sort of diet craze on hemp, it will stick. It will become, as it has been in places like uh, Persia before it was Iran and, and into the modern era, um, hemp 
has been the go-to after school snack, you know, then in absence of Doritos or whatever the kids eat, you know, and that tied them over between school and soccer practice. It was, you went to the street vendor and got this little bag of, of, of warm roasted salted uh, hemp seeds. And it's just what everyone ate every day. So imagine if every chip or pretzel eaten instead was delicious roasted hemp seed, um, you know, sprinkled with macadamia nuts in Hawaii or sprinkled with CBD in certain cases or sprinkled with, with um, um, you know, some delicious natural topping, cacao powder or something, whatever it is. Um, we really do have a shot at getting those 200 something million acres cultivated domestically if it does become a food staple diet. Now here's where the realism comes in. When I was speaking to those professionals in interviews for the book, they pointed a couple of things out. They, you know, they wouldn't be doing it if they weren't believers and they didn't think that it could happen. But here's a few things to know about hemp as a food. When it is, first of all, it's a nut, by the way. It's not a, it's not a seed product. It's, it has a nutty flavor, so you can make it into nut butter and hemp milk, and those are all good things, great products. When you press the seed and, and extract the oil, again, a superfood, something that I eat nearly every day. I eat hemp every day, but hemp seed oil, you no, know, I do eat hemp seed oil every day. Um, the, it, you can't cook with it. So it's out of that product line of sauteing. It's very much in that product line of adding to dips, shakes, yogurts, um, um, uh, other kinds of products, uh, cereals, especially the, yeah, and the protein byproduct of the hemp product goes into just about everything. Hemp hearts are delicious. I like to eat whole hemp seeds. It's just these days, the reason why there's a hemp heart market, which is de-whole hemp seeds is because you can't ship viable hemp seeds. You have to roast them, which is fine, but some people want raw, including myself, want raw food. Since I grow it myself, I can eat the whole seed. So hemp hearts or hemp seeds, whole hemp seeds are uh, things that I all again eat every day and put in, put in yogurt and everything else. So when you're an entrepreneur and an evangelist, like a, like a Chad Rosen of Victory Hemp Foods of, or a Roger Gushes of Healthy Hemp Seeds, they point out, I remember Chad said to me, a tablespoon of hemp seeds and yogurt doesn't make a food craze. In other words, it's going to take a whole lot of different markets and awarenesses for us to have it be, like people eat pasta and rice today, like people um, eat major, major wheat products uh, uh, migrating uh, to hemp. And I, I think they will. Yeah. Well, how can our listeners go out and support a hemp farmer? First and foremost, um, you can be a hemp farmer, by the way. It's one of the best things you can do to personally help mitigate climate change in your own garden. Get yourself a hemp permit in your state. It's not that big a hassle. And um, just plant it just for climate change mitigation. It'll help your garden anyway. Um, and if you know if you if you really want to grow it for food and have healthy soil, you can add superfood to your diet uh, from it. But if you're not going to cultivate it yourself or not enough for your family to have, look in your region uh, for all your hemp products, whether they're superfood from the seed or uh, flower-based cannabinoids, whatever. Or for that matter, if you want to use hemp herd for uh, horse bedding, it's really a wonderful microbial balance thing. Look in your region, look in your area, look in your town, you know, start first and foremost, do I, can I know the farmer? And if that works, do an online search. That's best. If you don't, uh, if the search shows you, Oh, but actually they do, they go to this farmer's market here or they're available online and it's only one County away. That's a good way to go. Food co-ops will often have regional products and really ask the questions, really look at the ingredients, look for organic, Look for uh, regionally grown and make sure that it's clear that in that enterprise, the farmer is at the ownership level. You, that's At once, you're going to get the best hemp product for your own family's bodies. You're going to do the best to be building farming communities and their economies when farmers are getting the retail dollar. Um, and you're going to be helping fight climate change because regenerative hemp grown outdoors organically in native soil under God's sun is, is, is how carbon... Uh, uh, get sequestered. And, and if you start shopping like that, not just for hemp, but all your products, including your material products, I believe and with a Pearl Harbor men mentality on this kind of thing, we, we really can uh, mitigate climate change and move to the, we can thrive in the post-petroleum era instead of um, being worried about resources uh, as we transition. So that's the, that's the best thing 
folks can do for any regenerative hemp entrepreneur. And if you're interested in reading any more of my stuff, um, kind of one-stop shopping at dougfine.com has everything from all my books to uh, plus the ones that are on audiobook and ebook plus uh, uh, TED talks, United Nations testimony, uh, link to the, the regenerative hemp course that I'm doing with the wonderful folks at Acres USA um, and uh, um, the dispatches. You can subscribe to my dispatches from the Funky Butte Ranch uh, newsletter, a free uh, thing uh, that I send out fairly, fairly regularly um, with an optional uh, support uh, button there. So, oh, and my social media. So that's dougfine.com and my social media is at organic cowboy, all one word. Thanks so much for joining us, Doug. As always, Ben, thanks for having me on Tractor Time. It's always awesome. There you have it. Go buy Doug's new book at the AcresUSA.com bookstore. Use the coupon code JANPOD, that's J-A-N-P-O-D, for 10% off on American Hemp Farmer and all other titles in the store. And if you're interested in growing hemp yourself, Doug's new course is a great place to start. Visit learn.acresusa.com to sign up. And thank you for listening to another episode of Tractor Time brought to you by Acres USA and TPS Lab. Subscribe to our channel on YouTube, iTunes, or anywhere podcasts are available. Also find us on acresusa.com, ecofarmingdaily.com, and don't forget to subscribe to our monthly magazine. Thanks for listening and have a great week.